came in and in two hours, nine years work, they're just gone. While John Major juggles with the economy, Britain's small businessmen are going bust. Last month, John Elliott made an agonizing decision. He surrendered to the cruel realities of the recession and shut down his small company on this Birmingham industrial estate. On that floor, there were nine units, still up. Four of those are occupied. The other five are empty. Two years ago, you could walk into that place and you could hear the work going on. It was a very, very busy little estate. John Elliott's four-man firm made protective shields for factory equipment. Now it's locked up by the bailiffs. Recession struck in 1990. Orders fell off, and he faced a stark choice. Shut down or find more cash. He remortgaged his home. Did you take any professional advice about the wisdom of this course of action? No, not really, no. So what made you take this decision? We really felt that um, we'd got a chance of survival based on the information that was coming from government at the time. They were saying that um, the recovery was just around the corner, months away. What we are seeing is the return of that vital ingredient, confidence. The green shoots of economic spring are appearing once again. John Elliott thought the second mortgage would buy enough time to weather the recession. But as the months went on, so did the recession. It was a nightmare. The orders just didn't come. It didn't matter how hard we worked. What we were looking at all the time was a decreasing level of orders. And when did you finally realise that it was all over? About a month ago I decided that there was no recovery on the way. We were nowhere near recovery. At that time, um, the word coming out of Parliament was not recession, it was slump. John Elliott has lost everything. The house that has been home to his family for the last 18 years has to go. Because of his debts, he's been forced into bankruptcy. OK. Um, You've already had one adjournment um, of the possession hearing right, for the yeah. second mortgagee. John Elliott has been guided through the anguish of bankruptcy by the Money Advice Centre in Birmingham. The house remortgaged to save his business and anything of value must be sold off to pay his debts. I think that where there is very little equity in the family home, uh, that to, to turn um, a couple out of their home uh, and make them homeless is, um, it, it seems to me, uh, unreal um, in, in the 20th century. It's almost going back to Dickensian times. So I've got no choice. But bankruptcy to me was the absolute last resort. It wasn't a convenient thing to get out of a situation. We fought very hard, long and hard, to save the business and save the property. Now we've got nothing. Nervous about bad debts, banks have been putting small businesses through the hoop. The Hankey family are packing up the contents of their house. Like so many who signed up for the enterprise dream in the 80s, they could only get bank support by putting their house on the line. In the 90s, they've lost their business, the support of the bank, and now they're losing their home. 23 years of married life and hard work wiped out in a matter of days. Eddie Hankey and his partner ran their business Astrotech Services from an office across the road. They stripped deadly asbestos from schools, hospitals and other buildings. And what did having your own business mean to you? Um, Self-respect. 
um, honestly self-respect really and the fact we were building up something from scratch uh, the way we wanted to build it up and um, it was extremely successful and did you enjoy it oh in intensely intensely they thought the business was in good shape and their customers usually paid their bills so the hankies weren't worried when their bank lloyds sent an accountant to look at the books but the report by accountants Coopers and Librand stunned Astrotech's directors. It recommended that to protect the bank's interests, a receiver should take over the company and sell it off. What did you think about the report? Absolutely disgusted, to be fair. Um, but what can you do? They're the institutions, the powerful people. I think it was just at, at the, the start of the, the worst part of the recession. They just decided that they didn't want to support um, our type of company. The Hankies contested the death sentence on their business and shortly afterwards the bank admitted in a letter that Astrotech was solvent and probably profitable. But even so, a week later, Lloyds called in the receivers. You wrote to them a few days uh, before you pulled the plug on them saying that you believed you accepted their management accounts that they were solvent. We didn't accept their, their management accounts. The, the but you wrote to them saying that you did. On te they were technically solvent. Uh, so if they're uh, technically paper. solvent, why did you pull the plug on a company that had 30 employees and two family homes to back it? The fact remains was they could not for their, pay their debts as they fell due. Uh, because you weren't helping them out with their short-term ter short cash flow problem. Well, how long is a piece of string? I think that's a very unkind comment to make. The Lloyds Bank have been very, very helpful to this company over a period of years and uh, would have carried on uh, being able to help, but they'd uh, run out of cash, they'd taken on far too many commitments, and they'd allowed uh, the business to run away with them. Astrotech's business was quickly sold off by the receiver. The bank claimed they acted for the benefit of Astrotech's shareholders and creditors. But the shareholders are losing their homes, and the small tradesmen who were owed money got nothing. Have you had any of the money that Astrotech owe you? No, nothing. And what's losing that money meant to you? Two and a half thousand pounds would mean two weeks' wages for the staff. And what's your company's experience being of um, getting money back once companies have gone into liquidation? We've never had any money from, from any company going liquidated on us. When banks, the government and those who wind companies up have had what's owed to them, there is rarely anything left for small traders like Mike Foston. Is it not true that the only people that have benefited from you pulling the plug on Astrotech have been Lloyds Bank and the, and the accountants that you appointed? I think it's a very unkind remark. But is it not true? I don't think it's true at all. And it, when a company, Who else has benefited? When a, well, hang on just a minute. When a company goes into receivership, it's a, it's a sad state for anybody because nobody wins. The, the shareholders don't win, the creditors don't win, and the bank certainly doesn't win. If you lose your home or lose everything, and pay the money back to the people that are owed the money, there might be some sort of comfort in that. But the people that are owed the money, i.e. The, the trade creditors, they get nothing anyway. And they'll just be one of us. If they continue not to get paid, be a knock -on effect. there'll be a knock-on effect and, and they'll be just one, one of us. Down. Another one will go down. Like there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds every day. Morning, Bankruptcy Association. Shocked by what was happening to her family, Jill contacted the Bankruptcy Association for advice. Now she runs their inquiry line for others in the same situation. Right. We, we have so many architects ringing us. We've got everybody from plumbers, um, restaurant owners, architects, solicitors, accountants, chemists, doctors, dentists, undertakers contacting us. We have people that 12 months ago were millionaires that next week will be bankrupt because of the policies of this government. 90 people a day in the UK are going personally bankrupt and thousands of companies will go bust this year. An estimated million people have been put out of work by the closure of small businesses. Well, on average, I would think I speak to probably eight or ten people a week who are actually contemplating suicide because of serious financial problems or bankruptcy. It's absolutely horrendous. 
When a company comes under fire from creditors, the pressure can become intolerable. A thousand feet above sea level, high on the Yorkshire moors, the cold wind of the recession touched the racing stables of trainer William Pierce. He'd built up Hamilton House stables virtually from nothing. In just over five years, he saw more than 150 of the horses he trained race to victory. William Pierce shared his home with Helen Inskip and their son Sam. The stables were quite severely hit by the recession because unfortunately we had become very, very highly geared as a, as a racing establishment towards using um, racehorses as a means of corporate and promotional activity for corporate clients. Um, a lot of our clients had equally been hit by recession and obviously as a result of this their promotional budgets had been reduced. Property developers, uh, financial advisors, stockbrokers, equally because of the recession had their income and their, their spare cash severely cut and as a result they didn't have that money to, to actually put into to racing. Falling business meant that by last June, William Pierce was having problems with his overdraft. To carry on, he would have to remortgage the property, with all the risks that involved. Then on June 15th, he was visited by a private debt collector, hired by the local VAT office. He'd been sent to recover tax arrears of about £6,000. The man turned up unannounced, early in the morning. Just three hours later, William Pierce walked out alone over the gallops where his horses trained, and shot himself. It came as a complete shock. To all intents and purposes, he was normal with his staff. He rode out as he normally would have ridden out, discussed all the plans for the horses which were due to run that week. Um, came in, had a word with our secretary, but just wasn't here when I called. So was there anything else apart from the visit from the VAT which might have changed his mood? Um, again, it's very difficult, but in hindsight, no, because apart from the visit from the VAT inspector, everything that morning was normal. It might be possible that if William had been undergoing severe depression or severe pressure, that that visit might well have been the final straw within a, a sequence of, of other problems. How would you feel if you opened a newspaper and read, like we did in June, that a, a man who owned a racing stables had shot himself three um, hours after the VNT had been round? I'm not sure that you can always attribute uh, actions directly to VAT in a case like that. Clearly, extremely unfortunate. And we would be concerned, and will be concerned in a case like that, that we had not acted uh, in the wrong manner. But I think it is unlikely that VAT, if it was a cause of those circumstances, would have been the only cause. However, World in Action has discovered that there has been no internal VAT investigation into the conduct of their visit on that tragic morning. The stables were left to Helen Inskip and Pierce's son Sam to continue what he had started. I think with William probably his biggest problem was that failure was unacceptable to him. A man who wouldn't accept failure in other people and equally wouldn't accept it in himself. Although things don't often reach this desperate stage, for the small retailer racked by the recession, the attentions of a government tax collector can be the kiss of death to a lifetime's work. <laughs> This is Jackie Morgan. She's a model and clothes designer. For nine years, she ran a successful fashion business. She counted royalty amongst her customers. But like many retailers, she fell victim to the recession. I mean, we were teetering on the edge and like lots of other people, having a rough time, but I actually thought that we would be all right in the end. Until this summer, Jackie's designs were sold in her shop in a pretty Sussex village. She fell behind with a VAT payment of around £6,000. Jackie wanted time to hold a sale, raise the money she owed and close down. But the VAT wouldn't wait. The VAT people came in and in two hours, nine years' work had just gone. 
they just sort of systematically cleared the shelves and put it all into a big van and everything was gone and the shop was empty. Customs and excise VAT have harsh powers to seize goods without a warrant and sell them to get what's owed. In Jackie's case, her stock ended up being auctioned off. Now it's sold at knockdown prices on market stalls all over South East England. Morning, can I help you, sir? Morning. Where'd you get these from? Um, they was bought at an auction. Where was that? Where was the auction? At Seven Oaks. Or, or around there. Are you familiar with At the auction, her designer clothes had raised only £1,600, a fraction of their worth, and just a quarter of her VAT bill. I, th I think if they'd actually let me have a sale, they, they would have got their full amount back. Um, and I wasn't saying that they, they weren't do it at all, and I, I feel particularly bad about um, the people I owed money to. I would have liked an awful lot of other people to have got something out of it as well. As it's turned out, nobody's got anything, not even the VAT people. There are cases where things are sold off not for their proper value. You fail to gather all the revenue and other creditors don't get paid. How can that be right? If there are cases where the goods don't fetch their proper value, that is down to the markets. We can't dictate the price of goods will fetch at auction. We do use a reasonably professional system of valuation. We use professional bailiffs to value goods and normally their judgment is correct. Left with no way of paying her debts, Jackie was forced into bankruptcy. She now rents the house she once owned from the building society. When they sell it, she and her daughter will be homeless. And I found tremendous sympathy. And I think people are thinking, well, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Small traders can also fall victim to bureaucratic blunders. And what chance do they have if the taxman won't admit he's got it wrong? Nottingham plumber Barry Ambrose had rarely been in debt. Well, I had a bank account in that West, and I think I've been overdrawn twice in 21 years. Now he's fallen foul of a system that allows VAT customs and excise inspectors to make hundreds of people bankrupt every year. As a tradesman, he must charge his customers VAT and pass it on to the government. Basically, so I'm, a, I'm a, an untrained, unpaid tax collector. Um, if I went for a job at the vast office, I couldn't get one because I'm not qualified, but I've got to be able to do it regardless. Barry wanted to pay the small amount he owed the VAT, but couldn't get an accurate bill. He still hadn't received one when out of the blue they threatened him with bankruptcy. Shocked, the Ambroses contacted their VAT official. He reassured me yet again not to worry. Please don't worry about it, Mrs Ambrose. I will sort it out. The bankruptcy order will not go through, rest assured. They were reassured. Little did they know that a hundred miles away in London, VAT officials were going to the High Court to have Barry made bankrupt. A friend rang me one Friday evening, that Friday, particular Friday evening, um, and commiserated about the fact that he'd been made bankrupt, and I just didn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. And it there in black and white in the evening paper was declared to everyone. I just couldn't understand what had happened. Barry, how did you feel about it? Uh, absolutely devastated because I'd just taken delivery of £1,500 worth of goods that morning. And I thought, well, what do the people think of me where I've got them from? Um, you must think I'm a crook. So Customs and Excise bankrupted Barry Ambrose for not paying a bill they admit was wrong, although he had enough money to pay what he owed. There are supposed to be procedures to prevent this sort of mistake. There is a, a very professional complaints procedure in the department, it's monitored centrally. We're accountable to Parliament for the standards that our officers adopt. We're accountable for our actions and we're accountable to the taxpayer for the action we take against him. If that action is wrong, then the taxpayer can have, can have recourse to his MP, to the Ombudsman. The system itself stinks. It stinks because 
there are no checks and balances that allow the small person to say, stop. You know, this is all wrong, and I actually require someone independently to have a look at it. The customs and excise clearly don't have effective internal checks. We don't understand it anyway. Um, Brought to their knees by a tax blunder, the Ambroses were now to discover the full horror of their situation. Once a person is made bankrupt, their debts escalate. On top of what they already owe are added the enormous fees charged by government, accountants and solicitors. Insolvency experts Panel Kerr Forster were appointed as trustees to supervise Barry Ambrose's bankruptcy. Their latest estimate reveals that already his original debt has more than trebled to £15,000. The Ambrose's local MP has taken up their case. Certainly at the point at which the trustees become involved, the thing becomes a nightmare that rolls out of all control. I mean, we're creating a new tier of public parasites. And uh, it doesn't matter whether the economy is in recession. These parasites are actually living off the bones of the companies that have been declared bankrupt. World in Action asked Panel Kerr Forster to be interviewed for this program. Twice they agreed, but twice they pulled out. It's the added costs which mean the Ambrose's house, of which Barry owns half, must be sold. Anne Ambrose, who owns the other half, is powerless to stop it. There must be a lot of women in my position. I seem to have no rights. Absolutely no rights. At the end of the day, they want the ass. All they're interested in is getting the ass. If I didn't own this ass, they wouldn't even bother about me. They wouldn't want to know me, because I've got off share in this ass. They want it. We ought to make it unacceptable for people's houses to be taken in pursuit of uh, bankruptcy settlements. We ought to have a system whereby the code of behaviour of the VAT, of banks, of the Inland Revenue uh, and of insolvency agents of the trustees ought to be open to public scrutiny and challenge. Eight months ago, the Ambroses appealed to the Ombudsman. So far, they have heard nothing. Barry, Anne and Leela, their daughter, have suffered a double blow. All because of blundering bureaucracy and a system that has difficulty admitting it's made a mistake. Anne Ambrose sees few options left. They're going for an eviction order and I face homelessness. The third option is suicide, which I can tell you, you do get to. But if you, can, if you commit suicide, then they've won. Jill Hankey and many like her are contemplating an uncertain future. Would you go into business again, Jill? No, I wouldn't. Absolutely not. Uh, to me, going into business in the current climate is suicidal. Absolutely not. Norman Lamont at one stage stood up in Parliament and said that it was a price worth paying. If I met him, I'd tell him he was completely wrong. He just doesn't know what he's talking about. It isn't worth a price. And I say that for anyone in my situation. It is not worth a price. And what is the price that you've paid? Everything I've got. Every worldly possession I've got, that has been the price I've paid. Thank God I've got a fine family and we're looking to the future and we'll survive. But that man was wrong. We would like to make clear that Mr David Sullivan, the subject of last week's programme, is not associated with the charity Trans World Radio. He is associated with another company, Trans World Communications. We regret any confusion.